Hello and a warm welcome to all. Today we are going to discuss some of the literary terms and figurative language as prescribed in the syllabus. Let me just share my screen. So literary terms and figure of speech. We'll start with us. As you all know, farce is a comedy that seeks to entertain an audience through situations that are highly exaggerated, extravagant, ridiculous, absurd, and improbable. It was in 15th century France that the term farce was first used, first used to describe the elements of clowning, acrobatics, caricature, and indecency, found together within a single form of entertainment. Farce is also characterized by a heavy use of physical humor, the use of deliberate absurdity or nonsense, satire, parody, and mockery of real-life situations, people, events, and interactions, unlikely and humorous instances of miscommunication, ludicrous, improbable, and exaggerated characters, and also broadly stylized performances. So here all these things are attacked by the use of physical humor. For example, the interludes of John Haywood, which uh, was uh, like John Haywood lived during 16th century in England. And uh, also if you were to quote the examples from Shakespeare, whose plays The Taming of the Shrew and The Comedy of Errors have uh, the farcical elements in abundance. Uh, Next figure of speech is hyperbole. Hyperbole is actually the use of exaggeration as a rhetorical device. So it is a figure of speech which uses exaggeration as a rhetorical device. Here, like um, the language is excessive. In poetry, as well as in oratory, it, uh, it is used and it emphasizes as well as evokes strong feelings and creates strong impression. So hyperbole is often used for emphasis or effect. For example, when we say that he was so angry, I thought he was going to kill someone. I had to wait in the station for 10 days and eternity. So here it is like just to emphasize the effect. We never kill someone out of anger, like not like that. I mean, when we are just angry, we don't kill people for small things, for petty things. And also like waiting just for 10 days and comparing it to an eternity. So it is an excessive language. Another example from Macbeth, Neptune's ocean washed this blood clean from my hand. No, this hand will rather the multitudinous seas in Carnadine, making the green one red. Next literary term is satire. Now satire is an artistic form chiefly literary and dramatic, in which human or individual vices, follies, abuses, or shortcomings are held up to censure by means of ridicule, derision, burlesque, irony, parody, caricature, or other methods, sometimes with an intent to inspire social reform. In other words, it is a way of criticizing people or ideas in a humorous way especially in order to make a political point or a piece of writing that uses this style. The great Roman poets, Horace and Juvenal, they set indelibly the liniments of the genre known as the formal verse satire. And in so doing, they exerted pervasive and indirect influence on all subsequent literary satires. So we have Nicholas Bollio, Dryden, Poe, who wrote in the 17th and the 18th century. And they were known for their satirical work. Other examples include Swift's Gulliver's Travel, Orwell's 1984, Huxley's Brave New World, and Pope's Danciad. Next, uh, Thomas' Prologue and Epilogue. 
Now, an epilogue is a concluding section of a story or play that provides closure or ties up loose ends. A prologue, on the other hand, is an introductory section that sets the stage for the story to follow. Now, as it is obvious, an epilogue is placed after the main body of the story, while a prologue is placed at the beginning. Now, the purpose of an epilogue is to summarize the events that have taken place, while the purpose of a prologue is to provide background information and establish the setting. In other words, an epilogue is the final chapter, while the prologue is the first. Uh, famous prologues, we have examples from um, like the Canterbury days, the prologue is a very famous one. Another example is uh, like can be quoted from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the opening lines. They provide background information about the feud between the two families of Capulet and Montague. Another example of prologue is Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which sets the stage for the epic story to commence. Now, epilogue examples, we have uh, the epilogue from Jane Eyre, very famous uh, book written by Charlotte Bronte, where she says that, Reader, I married him. A quiet wedding we had. He and I, the parson and clerk, were alone present. Also from Midsummer's Night Dream, uh, if we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here, while these visions did appear. Again, uh, one from Animal Farm. Years passed, the seasons came and went, the short animals' lives fled by. A time came when there was no one who remembered the old days before the rebellion except Clover, Benjamin, Moses, the raven, and a number of the pigs. Okay. Next literary term, rather the expression, is art for art's sake. This was actually a slogan which meant that the beauty of the fine arts is reason enough for pursuing them, that art does not have to serve purposes taken from politics, religion, economics, and so on. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Edgar Allan Poe, and Oscar Wilde argued for the doctrine of art for our sake. Now, art for our sake was a slogan translated from the French La Art Poe, La Art which was coined in the early 19th century by uh, a French philosopher, Victor Cousin. The phrase expresses the belief held by many writers and artists, especially those associated with aestheticism, that art needs no justification, that it need serve no political, didactic, or other end. Now, the explicit slogan is associated in the history of English art and letters with Walter Pater, and his followers in the aesthetic movement, which was self-consciously in rebellion against Victorian moralism. It first appeared in print in English in two works published simultaneously in 1868, in Pater's uh, review of William Morris's poetry in the Westminster Review, and the other in William Blake by Algernon Charles Swinburne. However, William, William Makepeace Thackeray had used the term privately in an 1839 letter to his mother in which he recommended Thomas Carlyle's miscellanies, writing that Carlyle had done more than any other to give art for art's sake its independence. A modified form of Pater's review appeared in his studies in the history of the Renaissance, one of the most influential texts of the aesthetic movement. Next uh, literary term is expressionism. So expressionism is basically defined as the artistic style in which artist seeks to pursue not objective reality, but rather the subjective emotions and responses that objects and events arose within a person. The artist accomplishes this aim through distortion, exaggeration, primitivism, and fantasy, and through the vivid, jarring, violent, or dynamic application of formal elements. In a broader sense, it is one of the main currents, like it was one of the main currents of art in the late 19th and early 20th century. And its qualities of highly subjective, personal, spontaneous self-expression are typical of a wide range of modern artists and art movements. 
So here, like I've just provided a background, how it arose during World War and what were the important, like who were the important precursors of expressionism. Like uh, we have scholars like Frederick Nietzsche, whose novel, The Spoke Zarathustra, is taken as a foremost example of expressionism. Then uh, the Swedish dramatist August Strindberg, his trilogy to Damascus. And um, also we have the American poet Walt Whitman, whose Leaves of Grass is an inspirational work in this genre. Then the Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, and also the Austri Austrian psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. These are the important exponents of expressionism. They explored in their place the predicaments of representative symbolic types rather than of fully developed individualized characters. Emphasis was laid not on the outer world, which is merely sketched in and barely defined in places or time, but on the internal, on an individual mental state. Hence, the imitation of life is replaced in expressionist drama by the ecstatic evocation of states of mind. The leading character in an expressionist play often pours out his or her woes in long monologues, couched in a concentrated, elliptical, almost telegrammatic language that explores youth's spiritual malaise, its revolt against the older generation, and the various political or revolutionary remedies that present themselves. So here are uh, some of uh, the expressionist paintings. To see the famous paintings, the boy, the like the old man with a broken neck. Okay, so we shall discuss the other terms in the next video. Thank you.